No other photographer makes me think, how the hell did he do that on such a consistent basis as Trent Park? With a keen eye and obsessive work ethic, he's able to transform the banal into the magical. Through his lens, a moving bus becomes a shadowy puppet play. A steam-clean sidewalk becomes a tropical rainforest. An underwater swimmer becomes a renaissance painting. His work defies categorization, and his results are as impressive as the inordinate amounts of time he dedicates to his craft. Park has an incredible appetite for experimentation, and a lust for life which clearly comes across in his work and in his interviews. It could take me a day, it could take me a month. Until I get that picture, I can't sleep. I am just restless. You're in a sense thinking, it's gonna happen here. I know that there's gonna be a great picture happen here. Sooner or later, it's gonna happen. But I've gotta be there to capture it. Born and raised in the suburbs of Newcastle, Australia, his work is very personal and rooted in his life experiences. What I'm just trying to do is show you what it was like to live when I was alive and what I was seeing, and that's important to me. One of the major formative events of his life was the sudden loss of his mother, who was also a photographer, at the age of 12 or 13. She died of an asthma attack right before his eyes. Too traumatized to even attend her funeral, Park suffered an existential crisis, questioning everything around him. He turned to his mother's dark room for comfort and picked up her camera, beginning an obsessive search for meaning and purpose that continues to this day. At the age of 20, Park moved to Sydney to look for work as a photographer while also playing cricket at a professional level. The photo book Dream Life, first published in 1999, captures the surrealistic sense of isolation he felt when moving to the big city. He eventually got a job as a sports photographer for The Australian. During his 10 years on the job, Park honed his technical skills to a razor's edge while developing his sense of anticipation a skill which would prove invaluable in his later career. In 2007, he passed a rigorous test to become a Magnum photographer, and he remains the prestigious agency's only Australian member. Park is a storyteller at heart, and prefers to display his work sequenced in photo books and exhibitions. Due to the long-term nature of his projects, he favours film because it stays consistent over the years, whereas digital equipment can change radically over a short period of time. If there's one persistent theme across Park's work, it's the serendipitous nature of ambient light. When I'm shooting, I don't remember anything. I might shoot for an hour constantly, I might go through rolls and rolls of film, I'm in the zone. It just takes over. And at the end of it, finally the light disappears, it goes by a cloud and bang, it's done. And then I'll sit there and go, what just happened? The light of an outdoor scene can change deceptively quickly. Before you know it, the moment is gone, victim to a passing cloud or a building in the sun's path. You can't control the whims of the weather or traffic or human behavior, but you can control your reaction to it. All we can do is prepare and hope for the best. As the saying goes, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And to illustrate this principle, we're going to try to recreate two of Trent Park's most famous images. 
The first is Untitled from 2001. I guess we can call it The Glowing Man. And the second is Moving Bus from 2003. What is going on in this picture? Why is this man so grossly incandescent? He kind of looks like one of those spinning dancer illusions. On first glance, he can't tell if he's facing the camera or walking away from it. Well, let's see how Trent Park came up with this shot. Compared to a lot of other cities worldwide, Sydney is relatively small. Repeatedly circling the same streets provoked me to come up with new ways of showing the place. This in turn led to constant experimentation, especially with light, and a concern with how photographic technique relates to the conceptual and emotional content of a picture. I can't remember the exact moment, but one day I thought I should try to shoot a person dressed entirely in white, walking directly into the harsh sunlight. I achieved this photograph on the same day the idea came to me. For the next few days, I took hundreds more similar shots, but none worked as well as this one. So it looks like we have an elderly man, dressed in white, walking across a narrow patch of bright sunlight. It's important to remember that cameras have a more limited dynamic range than the human eye. If we looked at the scene in real life, we could probably make out the details of the man's clothes while also seeing the background. But with cameras, if the difference in brightness is too wide, then you kind of have to pick whether you want to preserve the shadows or the highlights by choosing where to meter. If you expose for the highlights, then the shadows will fade to black. If you expose for the shadows, then you get something like Trent Park's image, where the highlights appear pure white or blown out. So we just need to find an area where an isolated subject will be much brighter than his or her surroundings. Like Trent Park's image, we need a place where people with bright clothes will be walking, and which has intermittent patches of sunlight. This is easier in the summer because there's more sunlight and people tend to wear brighter clothes. I chose to go to Union Station in mid-September. There's a lot of foot traffic and the main hall has this large vaulted ceiling with small windows that allow sunlight to spill through in patches. Because of the angle of the sun's rays, these patches move throughout the day. So I had to be there at the right time when they would fall on walkable areas of the station. Based on previous visits during this time of the year, there's a 30 minute window of time at around noon. Now when it comes to figuring out our exposure triangle, we need to meter for the background, not the bright patches of sunlight. So I took a spot meter reading of the interior of the hall and adjusted my settings accordingly. Here are some test shots I took. You can see we're getting that glowing pure white effect. So we know we can at least get the subject, that's one half of the picture, but we also need a busy background. Unfortunately there wasn't a lot of foot traffic at this time of the day, but while I was standing around I noticed an art installation on one of the walls. It was a depiction of the very same hall, but full of people, and as luck would have it, one of the patches of sunlight fell right in front of it. It was a perfect backdrop, and so I decided to focus my attention on this area only. Soon enough, a couple of guys in bright summer wear walked in front of it, and I snapped away. This is the raw image, and with some basic adjustments and perspective corrections we get this. So that's one shot down, one to go. Next up we have Moving Bus. This is one of Trent Park's most mind-blowing images. Let's see how it was taken. This bus image came about because I had started to slow down the shutter speed while photographing Martin Place, the main business district in Sydney. In the corner of one of my pictures was a white van, and you could see someone's shadow cast onto the side of the vehicle. I couldn't work out how it had happened, so I kept going back to the same spot. I went each evening for about 15 minutes, 
when the light came in between two buildings. It happens only at a certain time of the year. You've just caught that little window of opportunity. I was relying so much on chance, on the number of people coming out of the offices, on the sun being in the right spot, and on a bus coming along at the right time to get that long, blurred streak of movement. If I didn't get the picture, then I was back again the next day. I stood there probably three or four times a week for about a month. I used an old Nikon press camera that you could pull the top off and look straight down into because I was shooting from a tiny tripod that was only about 8 centimeters high. I had tried to lie on the ground, but people wouldn't stand anywhere near me. I finally got this picture after about 3 or 4 attempts. I shot 100 rolls of film, but once I'd got that image, I just couldn't get anywhere near it again. That's always a good sign, you know you've got something special. The fact that the images of the people on the bus have stayed sharp and that you can see through them is something that still baffles me. People can't understand what the image is or how I was able to obtain it and I can't work it out myself. It's something that the eye can't see when you're walking along. It's something that only photography can capture. Let's take a closer look at where this image was taken. The business district in Sydney isn't that big and these buildings haven't changed much in the past 20 years, so I was able to find the exact place where a moving bus was taken. You can even see a painted bus lane. Although there are traffic lights, there's no painted crosswalk, and the street stands between two broad pedestrian corridors. That's why the people in Park's photo were standing so staggered instead of bunching up in one spot, as usually happens on a conventional street corner. If you look towards the west, you can see there's a gap between the buildings, so back in 2003, when the sun was low in the sky, it would have shone through and created those long shadows. Now we just need to find a place with similar conditions in Toronto. I chose Queen Street, right in front of Old City Hall. It has a lot of foot traffic and tall buildings to the east and south, but most importantly it has a large plaza to the west with lower density high rises which will allow the setting sun to shine through. So I grabbed my mini tripod, DSLR with kit lens, a couple of ND filters and headed downtown on a Monday evening right around 6pm. The skies were clear, which is important, because any clouds will wreck the shot. We need clear, unfiltered, free-range sunlight. I set my mini tripod a few meters away from the corner and aimed it at an angle towards a crosswalk. Because I knew if I stood right on the corner, people wouldn't stand anywhere near me, just like when Trent Park lay on the sidewalk. I knew there was no chance of getting that long line of staggered people, but if I could get two or three people in one shot, that would be enough for me. I set my shutter speed to one second, because based on the speed of the traffic at that intersection, that's how long I judged it would take a vehicle to cross the field of view of the lens. You don't want it too slow, because then the reflected sunlight won't be as intense. I set my aperture to f22 to avoid overexposure, and so I wouldn't have to worry about focusing. I had two ND filters on the camera, an ND8 and an ND4. I waited for vehicles to drive through and then hit the shutter. This works best with vehicles with lighter coats of paint because they will reflect more sunlight. You can really see the trial and error aspect of this and how many variables are involved. Here pedestrians were too much to the left and the background is blurred because the cheap mini tripod wobbled when I pressed the shutter. For this shot, we're getting that nice clear screen of light and sharp shadows, but the vehicle is too far from the curb. Here the vehicle is too far from the curb and we have some tripod wobble. Here 
Here the vehicle was actually too short, so the pedestrian heads were clipped. In this shot, a white double-decker tour bus came through, which would have been perfect, but there were no pedestrians on the sidewalk. Also, it was a bit too close to the curb. And then a minivan came through, and I finally got my shot. The next day, I tried to go to the same spot to get some more pictures, but it was occupied. And then the day after, it was cloudy. So many conditions have to be met to get an acceptable exposure. It's like uh, Anna Karenina. All perfect moving bus images are the same, but all imperfect ones are imperfect in their own way. But for my purposes, this last image was good enough. So there we have it, two attempts to imitate the photographic genius of Trent Park. This is just a tiny sliver of his work. If you really want a more comprehensive view of his artistic journey, I recommend watching the Black Rose documentary. And I'd like to conclude this video with a quote from that very same documentary. Photography is an extension of every thought that I have. It's almost linked to my hand in a way that it becomes part of you. I don't think about photography as making something for art or making it for the walls of a show. It's never about that. It's always for me just about finding the answers to life. That's what I'm looking for. And, it, and I guess that's what the Black Rose and what I've been trying to do is all about, that, that transient nature of the street, but indeed life itself.